Hello, it's such an honor to be here with folks who are joining this lecture. Um, my name is Jason Lohr, and um, I'm a physician by background and the CEO at SAC Health. And I'll be sharing top 10 innovative ideas for health centers and excited to be able to um, share with folks. A little bit about SAC Health. We're actually based in Southern California just uh, about an hour east of Los Angeles. We are officially a faith-based Christian health center. We are the largest uh, specialty-based health center in the United States. We uh, partner with Loma Linda University Health, which is a large academic medical center, also a Christian faith-based academic medical center. We also partner with Kaiser Permanente, and Kaiser is actually the largest healthcare organization in the United States. And we're uh, very grateful to be uh, partnered with both of these large organizations. It allows us to offer 35 different specialties to our patients and makes making us the largest specialty-based health center. We're also the largest teaching health center in the United States. We have over 400 residents that do continuity clinic within our FQHC. They come from all different specialties, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, OB, uh, orthopedics, ear, nose, and throat, and multiple other specialties, uh, including uh, multiple fellowships that are also based at the clinic. When I'm talking about the top 10 ideas, I'm going to be talking about things that we've actually learned over the past 11 years. We've only been in FQHC for 11 years, and but we come from a community clinic background, non-FQHC for the past 30 years. And uh, we were birthed out of Loma Melinda University that has been around for over a hundred years. So we've actually learned a lot as an FQHC and even previously from dozens of other healthcare organizations. And whenever we think, hear of a good idea or think of a good idea, we try to put it into practice. And if it sticks and works, then we continue using it. So we'll be talking about 10 different ideas and they're related to a lot of different things from care delivery to operations, to finances, human resources, population health, quality, governance and culture, learners, partnerships, and spiritual care. So let's get started. Number one is Grand Rounds, an example of care delivery. So a lot of folks may be familiar with regular Grand Rounds that are done in academic centers, where they talk about a specific case of a patient that they saw or a patient that was seen in the hospital or in the clinic setting. And typically all of the, the whole presentation about the, the patient and the disease process is presented. But what's typically lacking in those grand rounds is the patient themselves sharing their experience. So we created a grand rounds that was focused on the patient where we would actually interview the patient, have the patient in front of all the staff, all of the physicians, all of the residents in training, and we would be able to interview the patient and ask about their experience, have them share their story. And the best part about it is we get to ask the patient, are we living our mission? We, we read our mission statement and then we ask the patient, are we living this mission statement? We've had powerful and emotional share, stories shared over the years by our patients. And it's a great reminder of who we serve, that is the patient, and why we serve. And this is probably one of the highlights from a teaching perspective that we're able to, to do with our, with our staff and uh, with all of our providers. For more details, Dr. Kevin Shannon is, has a topic, is presenting specifically on this topic, has a separate session uh, just on our ground rounds. Two, outbound callers. 
This is under our operations department. And this was a new idea that we came up with when COVID hit. We actually created this in the very first two weeks of COVID because we realized at that time that, first of all, we may have to lay off staff. We had to close our dental clinic completely in the state of California. All dental clinics were closed for at least two months until they could figure out what to do with COVID and how to prevent COVID from spreading when we're working in someone's mouth. But instead of laying off workers, we just thought, could we repurpose and could we find a different thing for our, our workers to be able to do? And so we realized that there was a disconnect just because COVID was happening. It created a lot of anxiety among our patients to come in in person. This is right at the beginning of March of 2020. There was a lot of concern about, can I still be seen by my doctor? How can I see them? I don't want to come in person. And virtual visits were new. We had never done virtual visits before. In fact, our very first virtual visit was scheduled on March 12, which was a Thursday. And it was March 13, which was a Friday, that all the clinics in our two counties where we have our clinics were required to close and screen patients for COVID symptoms. And if anybody had any COVID-like symptom, they couldn't be seen in person. That created not only a barrier for our patients with COVID symptoms, but even a barrier for patients without COVID symptoms being afraid to come in and not knowing what to do. So patients had never had a virtual visit before. None of our patients or the majority of our patients had never had a virtual visit. And now we were all of a sudden pivoting to do virtual visits even though we only had one day of experience doing virtual visits under our belt when all of this uh, started. Having to pivot and having patients be able to understand, we thought we have to be able to explain to them what a virtual visit is. Can I still get my medications refilled? Can I still get my labs ordered? How, what if I need a, a mammogram? What if I need other things that have to be ordered? Um, is all of that possible? I think that was a brand new learning for all of us and our patients didn't understand. So we created outbound callers where we would actually take 10 staff, repurpose them to do outbound calls. So their whole purpose was to call our patients, say, we still have openings, it's a virtual visit, it can be a phone call, it can be a video, but we'll do everything we normally do in person. We'll ask all the same questions. We'll be able to get as much of a history as possible. We'll be able to refill meds, maybe even add an additional med if there's an indication. We'll be able to order labs. We'll be able to order any imaging tests. We'll be able to do all of your primary care and even all of your preventive care over, over the phone or over the video as much as is possible. And we saw that with this, outbound callers, um, we were able to call patients, explain to them what was happening, schedule patients. And within four weeks, by April, by the middle of April of 2020, our patient volumes were the same as pre-COVID and they never dropped again. This allows, allowed us to have strong financials throughout COVID, even though we did still get assistance that assistance was above and beyond because our volumes never dropped outside of those first four weeks. And those were really the four weeks it just took to pivot and move everything uh, to virtual or at least the majority of our visits to virtual. I would say that this was the single most impactful financial decision that we made as an organization, definitely during COVID. And I would probably say um, in my entire four years as CEO, that this was the single most impactful financial decision that was made. I'll say we have continued to this day and we now have, we've doubled our outbound callers. We have 20 staff and on average, they make 600 appointments per day for our organization. This is huge and um, it has just been a, a huge blessing that God gave us this, this idea to do. Number three is a financial one is creating a foundation. Um, I understand that not everyone may have the ability to do this, but we have wanted to have a larger impact 
on our community, to be able to partner with faith-based organizations, including local churches, and to even focus on things like international mission trips. We, we do a lot of service. A lot of our physicians have uh, our returned missionaries who've served abroad in, in multiple countries across the globe. And we feel like a foundation would allow us to be able to do a lot of these unique things to be able to um, attract mission aligned uh, providers and staff. Um, most of th these things cannot be covered under normal business of a clinic. So the foundation allows more flexibility in these areas of focus. And our board has committed to fund the foundation 10% of profit margin. Um, and this will be used to partner with churches, to provide scholarships, and to uh, arrange mission trips. We are still in the process of getting this approved, um, but if it is approved, and we hope it will be, um, we will be um, able to uh, really have a large, much larger impact uh, on our community moving forward. And so we're looking forward to the ability to do this as a very um, innovative idea uh, in the area of finances. Number four is really goes back to robust benefits. This becomes a human resources focus and really making sure that our employees feel valued, know that uh, we are paying and that we are reimbursing our folks for the amazing work that we do. We would not be here if it wasn't uh, for our team, for the work that they do um, every day. So one of the unique ideas that we have is a birthday holiday. In addition to all of our regular holidays that we provide our employees, paid holidays, we also include a birthday holiday. So the month of their birthday, they can take any day off during that month, um, as long as it's approved by their supervisor and they have an additional holiday and our employees have really, really loved this. Again, it's just one more day. Um, it does have a cost for sure, uh, but uh, what a difference it makes from a, from a morale standpoint for our employees. We also have chosen to have a no cost healthcare option. So that means that an employee could choose healthcare with zero out of pocket cost to them. The organization pays the full amount um, again, there's a tiered approach here, so there's um, multiple different options that employees can choose, but we always have an option with zero cost healthcare. And then we've pumped in like a lot of folks have over the last couple of years uh, during COVID and as uh, we're slowly emerging out of COVID and with the inflation impacts on our employees, um, increased our wages and, and, and pumped money back into, into our wages to create really a living wage for our employees that is significant and that makes a difference. I'll tell you that this has not been easy all the time for the organization, um, but it is the right thing. Long term, we're already seeing benefits from a, a retention perspective for our employees um, uh, by doing this. And I think there are companies that have focused on, on this over the years and done a very good job at recruiting and retaining employees. And that's uh, important. Number five, our population health team. This was created uh, some years ago when we realized that our UDS measures really weren't that good and we were struggling to be able to meet the UDS measures. And we just trying to brainstorm how we could improve this. Many times a patient would come in, see, see our physicians, but there were so many things that needed to be addressed. It was very difficult to get to all of the health maintenance and the care gaps that were there. And so we started thinking, well, how can we be more creative? How can we pull some of this out from the provider, the physician or the NP or the PA? You know, so much is on them every time they're seeing the patient. And can some of these things just be done outside? I mean, can I actually order some of these tests? Does a patient even have to come in to be able to be 
have a mammogram ordered, for example, can they just go and can it be ordered by someone else? And can the patient then go and get that done at the imaging center? Or if a patient needs lab work, like an A1C for their diabetes, can that just be ordered by a non-provider? And then they go and get those lab tests. Of course, that result will come into the provider, but then they would have some guidance on what to do next. You wouldn't, wouldn't have to see the patient just to order that, that test or colorectal cancer screening, right? A colonoscopy or a fit test. So all of these things we realized we could create a team and we could actually have that team focused on following up with the patients. We have the list of all the patients that need the various measures that comes from the health plan. We could actually use that list. We could run that list call those patients and get all of those things ordered without them coming in for an appointment. If they do find that there's a care gap that has to have an appointment, a pap smear or some other test that needs an in-person visit, then those can actually be scheduled and ordered. And we actually specify in the visit type that this is actually for a care gap closure. This is actually a population health visit for this specific care gap. So then the provider does know, I need to focus on this. Even if the patient's coming with a long list, I also need to help close this care gap because that was the specific reason the visit was closed. We found that having this population health team significantly improved our UDS numbers year after year. And we get paid for performance or P4P funds from the, the health plan. And we're able to actually fully fund the population health team with that income. So we realize, well, it takes money in order to do this, but we will hopefully be rewarded for that. And at the end of the day, it's not about a financial reward as much as it is for the care that we're providing the patient that we're able to provide and close these care gaps so our patients have better care. This has been a huge blessing for, for our patients for sure. Number six, quality bonus. So as, as we're talking about measures, this is in our quality realm. And we understood that even with the POP Health team, we're still going to have some care gaps. And there are times where, again, the providers are seeing a patient overwhelmed with all the things having to address, and there's still that care gap that needs to be addressed. We thought, okay, we want to incentivize, really encourage all of our staff, that is the front desk staff in the medical assistance, and our LVNs and our providers when they're seeing the patients, all the staff, that if we improve our quality, we'll be able to give back to our employees for this. We created a quality bonus that goes to all of our employees, whether they're clinical or non-clinical. And we have set the minimum at $500 per employee. That is not small, that's a fairly significant amount. Um, that is the minimum that everyone will receive. Uh, each year, we have not started this yet. We, we'll, we'll plan to uh, uh, give this here in the next six or seven months. Um, it'll be based on last year's numbers. And this actually goes up as high as $4,000 per employee based on what level of quality metric we're able to reach that is actually determined by our local health plan. The reason we can do this is again, we will be pumping those pay for performance dollars that come from the health plan back into our employees. So the majority of this, of these funds will actually go uh, directly to the employees that are actually doing the work. So we realize that those are the folks doing the work. Those are the folks that we need to give back to because they're the ones who, who've done that work. So we're looking forward to seeing how this uh, moves the needle. I'll tell you that we've already seen the last few months of 2022 that our quality numbers did improve after we announced this. We announced this in fall of 2022. We already saw those numbers uh, improve and we're looking forward to continually having everybody on deck, everybody on board, um, knowing that they can uh, make a difference. Okay, number seven is CEO final interviews. This is again, um, this is an area of governance and, and organization culture. And I have the privilege to be able to do final interviews with all candidates who are coming on board to the organization. 
They've already been interviewed. They've already been vetted by their specific team. Um, but I have the opportunity to do a final interview. It's usually typically a short 15, 20 minutes at the most. And then I take the opportunity to pray with candidates if they feel comfortable with that. I always ask if they feel comfortable with prayer. I'm able to share our mission and, and really confirm if the candidate is a good mission fit and very much enjoy meeting all the folks coming in. This is a touch point. There's not a lot of touch points that the CEO gets with individual employees. And so I love having a touch point at the very beginning. And, and this is allows me to have that touch point and get to know uh, folks who are coming on board. I actually got this idea from a CEO of a local health plan who did the same thing. But they had 2,500 employees at the time, and they're, and they're even bigger now. And at that time, we had about 350 employees. So I thought, okay, if someone who's eight times bigger can do this, I should be able to do this as well. I know there's not a lot of time. Uh, our, our leadership team and myself, we're always busy. There's always stuff to do. But again, it's putting value where value should be put. And in our team and employees, that value is important uh, to put uh, because those are the folks that are actually, again, doing the work. I would say that this has been probably one of the, the highlights for me and one I get feedback from all the time. Employees will say as I'm interviewing them, I've never experienced this before. The CEO has never interviewed me at any organization. Some of these folks have worked for 20 or 30 or 40 years in the workforce and they've never experienced this. I'm not surprised, but it still does um, make you think that this is, and some have said they worked for an organization for 10 years and never even met the CEO. Um, that is um, disappointing to hear, to say the least. So this has been very great from a governance and just to set the culture um, as, a, as a leader and been very blessed to be able to take part in um, final interviews. Number eight, this is creating a pipeline for our future employees. We have all of these learners that come that are a part of our organization. We're very, very blessed to have that. We have not only, as I mentioned earlier, over 400 residents from multiple different specialties, but we also have over 400 students that come from multiple schools, medical students, dental students, psychology students, pharmacy students. And many times we are their only exposure to community medicine or underserved medicine or FQHC. There, there's no other exposure that they get outside of our clinic system. And when they see what we are doing and they see the impact we're having on the community, many, not all, but many, become convinced that it is something that they want to do and that they want to be a part of. There's no better way of recruitment than to actually have the training done within the facility. And I know not everyone's able to do that, but the mo more that you can take on a student or a resident, even if it's for a short rotation of one month or longer, that makes a difference. And that exposure allows that learner to say, oh, I think I wanna be a part of this. There are really two things that are the most impactful on a, a learner deciding where they wanna to stay to actually practice their, their trade. And that is where they're from and where they train. And I'll tell you my experience where someone's trained, typically close to 80% will stay within a small geographic radius of where they train. They get comfortable, they're used to the area that they train and they're going to stay there. We're also blessed to not only have students and residents, but students that are from our medical assistant and community health worker uh, training. They act, we're actually their on-site training for um, MA and, and CHWs, and we're able to also hire those uh, directly from, uh, from, from the school. And we also have master's in healthcare administration students and management residents. So these are folks that can even help with our operational team and our management team. So not only are we able to recruit clinicians, which are really 
some of the most difficult um, recruitment is, is with our clinicians. But we have the broad spectrum. We are missing some areas like LVN, and we'd love to start um, a, an LVN program that we could train our LVNs on site. We have a lot of MAs that want to train as LVNs. It would be great for our employees as well to be able to do continued uh, training. So this again, another blessing to be a part of this. Number nine is our physician health plan partnerships. You know, one of our, when we talk about our mission statement, one of our pillars is partnerships. And I've always been a strong component that we're stronger together. Partnerships are super, super important. And we probably more than most federal clinics have a really, really strong history of partnerships. In fact, we hire no physicians directly. All of our physicians are contracted physicians with, with our partner organizations. So most of those contract physicians are with our academic medical center, which is Loma Linda University. That's the majority. So over 400 uh, contracted attending physicians that we work with allows us to have all of those specialties. As we mentioned, 35 different specialties. We have everything from cardiology, ear, nose and throat, orthopedics, and even subspecialties. So we have ENT ear, we have ortho elbow and knee. And sometimes, you know, I'm a primary care doc, so sometimes it's kind of overwhelming because I'm just like, I just want the patient to see an orthopedic surgeon. They don't have to be like the hip or the the knee person. Um, I just want a general orthopedist, but uh, we have all these subspecialties. So it is um, the hand doc or the knee doc or the foot doc. And it, it's a blessing, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of specialties and subspecialties in that as well. We have neurosurgery, for instance. So all of these are contract physicians because I can't hire a neurosurgeon full time in an FQHC. There wouldn't be enough work and they still need a hospital to be able to do surgeries at. So it may be one half day a month or two half days a month, or it may be full time with our primary care docs. They're all contracted. We also do the same thing with Kaiser Permanente. So we have Kaiser Permanente physicians uh, contracted and working uh, along with our Loma Linda physicians. Um, in the same facility. This allows for multiple specialties and specialists, often not needed full time, as I mentioned, and we pay by clinic half days. We just pay four hour shifts. And it's a great partnership um, to do that. We also, of course, during COVID had a lot of partner partners in the, or, or in, in the community. We partnered with our health plan to provide vaccines at local churches. And we have a community resource center where it's fully funded by our clinic with social workers and we partner with over a hundred community organizations because again, we can't, we focus on the medical, but there's so many other things that our patients need. So we have dozens, over a hundred community organizations that we partner with. Partnerships are super important um, for us as we serve our patients. Last thing is our spiritual care. Um, we do something unique. Uh, there's a lot of things I could focus on from a spiritual care perspective, but want to focus on our take two. That is actually two minutes. That's what we call it. Take two. It's two minutes every morning. It's 7.59 to 8.01. Uh, we read from scripture and we pray. It's quite simple. Multiple employees are involved in this. Uh, we do it in person at our main campus, but we have three floors at our main campus. So we have to zoom it so that the other floors of our main campus and all of our 11 locations can join in. We focus on a different theme each month, but it helps to just set the tone for the day for what we're doing, why we're doing it. And it is such a blessing to, to have this um, as an organization. So I hope you've enjoyed this focus on our top 10 innovative ideas that we've done as a health center. If you have any questions or need to reach me with anything, always happy to share. We've again learned so much of this from other health centers. We're always happy to share with other health centers. Uh, you can reach me. Um, my email is jlohr, J-L-O-H-R, at sacshealth.org. 
J L O H R at SAC S A C Health dot org. Blessings to all of you, and thank you so much for for listening. Take care.